um, Radboud University in the Netherlands, and she'll be talking about nutrition and fertility in women of reproductive age in the ne Netherlands. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'll show you some of the results of my master thesis, which I've done at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Briefly, so to start, why we did this study? We performed this study because subfertility, which is the inability to conceive after 12 months of unprotected intercourse, is estimated to have a prevalence of about 10% in the world's population. Therefore, it is a public health concern, and recognizing modifiable risk factors is important, modifiable risk factors such as diet. And also because little is known, there are few studies assessing dietary intake and fertility, especially in fertile women, and there is also inconsistency in the existing literature. Therefore, our aim was to perform an exploratory study to investigate the association between fertility and nutrition in women of reproductive age in the Netherlands, and how we did that. We investigated the diet of 1,283 pregnant women who were enrolled in the PRIDE study, PRIDE is short for Pregnancy and Infant Development Study. is a still ongoing uh, prospective court study in the Netherlands. We assessed their, their diets via a full frequency questionnaire. We obtained energy adjusted macro and micronutrient data, which we divided in dietary data from diet only and total nutrient intake data, uh, combining diet, um, dietary data and supplement intake, such as multivitamins, vitamin C, folate, and so on. We divided the intake in quartiles, actually the women in quartiles of intake, and we performed single nutrient analysis. Uh, we used caucus regression models uh, to estimate hazard ratios, and we corrected for uh, some confounders. And what we found? Uh, we found that vitamin B6, folate, vitamin D, and vitamin E at increased rates are associated with a prolonged time to pregnancy, TTP, so prolonged time to get pregnant. Uh, I would like you to focus not on the numbers, but on the patterns. So we found that total nutrient intake data, so combination of diet and supplement, was associated with a prolonged time to pregnancy in women in the higher quartiles of intake. This was also seen for vitamin E in the dietary uh, intake, so diet only. To give you an uh, idea of what this means, women on the fourth quartile of folate, total folate intake, nutrient intake, were 47% less likely to conceive than women on the first quartile of intake, which is the, the lowest quartile of intake. And here, a hazard ratio of one, more than one, is a good thing. So we, we want women to indeed get pregnant. And to finish, uh, we understand and acknowledge that dietary data is hard to to get, and we also understand the exploratory uh, nature of our study, and we advise that further studies are conducted in order to better explore or further explore this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Um, so I was at home last night, uh, just about to tuck into my plate of edible silkworms, and I was thinking, I was looking at my silkworms and thinking, I wonder, how the protein profile of these silkworms is affected by factors like their gender, uh, rearing substrate, and processing. And as luck would have it tonight, we're going to hear the answer to that question. Uh, we're moving from the Netherlands to Italy, and we have uh, Simona Cirincione from the National Research Council of Italy. Thank you. Okay, so I want to start. Um, I don't know. Okay. I want to. Oh, sorry. I want to start from a question. Should we all be uh, eating insects? Uh, I don't know, maybe yes or not, or uh, uh, it's uh, uh, our personal deci decision. But we have to think that there are a lot of areas in the world where insects are consumed. For example, uh, South of America, uh, South of Africa, and Asia. So. Uh, even if insects are not exactly we, uh, what we think about good and tasty uh, food, we have to think about some important evidences about nutritional benefits 
as a, uh, concerning macronutrients and micronutrients, uh, especially we have to think that uh, insect protein content uh, is uh, comparable to those of meat and fish. And also about the environmental benefits, uh, because uh, uh, eating uh, insects, we can have uh, benefits in terms of uh, gas production, feed conversion efficiency, and also land use. So let's go inside my study. Uh, we had two uh, main uh, goals. Uh, the optimization of rearing strategies for insects uh, using uh, an uh, artificial diet uh, as alternative to mulberry leaves. And the second, uh, to evaluate the largenicity of silkworm pupae. Why silk silkworm pupae? Because uh, uh, the pupae uh, are the main byproduct of a sericulture industry. So the use of pupae in feed and food sector, it could be uh, a good example of uh, uh, valorization, uh, waste is valorization. So let's go inside the uh, uh, experimental data. We perform a comparative proteomics. Uh, so the protein from uh, uh, female and male uh, uh, in uh, rated on artificial diet mulberry leaves um, were uh, compared. And we harvest the protein, uh, we, we um, extract the protein from our samples, we perform a, a bidimensional electrophoresis, and we identify the protein by LCMSMS. Few words about allergies uh, and, pro and processing, because uh, um, food allergies, uh, uh, food, food proteins uh, inside uh, uh, food uh, can be allergens when they are recognized by patients, by the IgE of patients uh, that are allergic to this food. And uh, in this case, processing is quite important because uh, um, for example, when we, uh, we have a high temperature, the temperature can change the protein structure and can change the interaction between proteins and the immune system. So um, concerning uh, food allergy, it's important because uh, some proteins that before processing were not uh, recognized by the immune system, after processing can be, uh, become new allergens. So be, um, making the food more allergenic. So next to the results, uh, we do some, uh, um, uh, uh, here we, uh, we observe, we, uh, we uh, add um, uh, statistical multivariate statistical analysis, uh, and we have the results by a PCI principal component analysis. We observe some different protein composition, um, uh, uh, best separated according to the sex than to the diet. And we found three well-known allergens, arginine kinase and 27 kilodalton gigaprotein uh, and kitinase. And we also here observe the um, allergenicity of two different uh, um, raw and fried uh, silkworm pooper. And we observe the different profiling, looking that the fried uh, silkworm pooper were more allergenicity compared to raw uh, one. Uh, so the uh, question that I asked you before, uh, maybe the, the answer is yes, we can do it because we have uh, a good knowledge and uh, uh, scientific instruments uh, to can hit uh, uh, insect uh, in a safe way. So if you are more interested and uh, you have question curiosity, my poster is uh, 172. Thank you, Simona. Um, just to continue with the creepy crawly theme, um, we're moving from silkworms to raw edible house crickets, um, which is really making my mouth water. Um, <coughs> Moving from allerg allergenicity as well, um, our next uh, presenter, Xavier fernandez Cassi from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, is going to look at raw edible house crickets and the microbial quality and safety of them. So over to you, Xavier. <coughs> uh, no. Come on. Uh, well, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, edible insects as no, uh, no uh, edible insects as novel food is a trending topic nowadays in Europe. Uh, in particular, one of the most promising edible insects is Aceta domesticus, or the house cricket. The reasons behind this is because this insect presents interesting nutritional profile. It's an easy to rear 
insect in comparison with others, which have more complex life cycles. And also, it presents a higher efficiency uh, compared to traditional livestock. Uh, despite the promising future of Aqueta domesticus, uh, several gaps need to be fulfilled regarding especially the microbial quality and the microbial communities of edible uh, crickets. For these reasons, in the uh, Swedish University of Agricultural Science, we uh, rare local crickets that were fed under controlled laboratory environment using three different feeds. One was a control feed, which is a food that is a feed that is commonly available uh, commercially, and the other two were based on red clover. The reason behind the use of red clover is because it's a plant that grows locally in Sweden and doesn't need uh, the, the use of pesticides and herbicides, so it's environmentally friendly. The objectives of this study were to assess the microbial loads and microbial safety of edible crickets by using pl uh, plating methodologies to describe the microbial communities of edible crickets by using uh, high throughput sequencing and the amplicon sequencing of 16S gene, and also to study the mold communities in edible crickets and their feeds. So the results of culture-dependent methodologies show that uh, crickets present a higher total aerobic counts and higher enterobacteriaceae counts. Despite these high values, uh, no um, pathogenic foodborne bacteria such as Salmonella, Listeria monocytogenes, Clostridium perfringens, or Bacillus thereus were detected by uh, plating methodologies. When we assess the culture independent methodologies, we see that no matter the feed use, uh, three filum uh, were the majority among the, the studied crickets. And uh, if we assess the genus that, this, uh, uh, that compose these microbial communities, we see that they are also commonly detected in gut microbiota. Um, however, we need to explore more this information to confirm uh, these results. Uh, finally, uh, regarding the identified molds, what we can see is that the feed presented different communities compared to the, uh, to the crickets itself. And I would like to highlight the fact that um, Aspergillus flavus uh, was detected in, cricks, in crickets, but not in their feet. As a conclusion, uh, a thermal treatment must need to be applied to decrease the high total aerobic counts and inactivate possible pathogenic bacteria. High throughput sequencing allowed the detection of pathogenic foodborne bacteria, for example, Clostridium perfringens, that could not be detected by uh, plating methodologies, raising questions about this, uh, the interpretation of high throughput sequencing results in the context of food safety, and also the presence of mycotoxin producing molds from a species Aspergillus raises concern about the safety of edible crickets as these mycotoxins cannot be removed by thermal treatments or in other systems. Uh, I would like to say thank you to the scientific team involved in all this project at the SLU in Uppsala, Sweden, and to the EUFORA Fellowship Program to give me, to give me the opportunity to, be, uh, to conduct this research. Thank you very much. My poster is the 144. Thank you. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, so we've had two uh, pitches uh, in the field of nutrition, and you can see more posters covering nutrition over there. We've had one uh, from biological hazards, which and the other posters for that theme are here. And now we're gonna move on to human health. More posters over there. And we're moving from Sweden down to the Czech Republic. And uh, we're gonna hear from Anna Morales Marco. Thank you to everyone. In this case, I will give just like a brief introduction of uh, what we are doing in terms of like high resolution mass spectrometry as a tool for detection and identification of organic substances of concern in food commodities as a part of human exosome study. I know human exosome study is massive, so we are just actually like uh, having like a tiny, tiny, or like I just give like the overview of a tiny perspective. Yeah, well, this is was actually my introduction. So this is the rest of the team I'm working with. And what we are basically doing is not that far from what uh, I would say a lot of uh, institutes are doing. So we are uh, interested on in how we are exposed, externally exposed to uh, certain organic pollutants. Uh, traditionally, we were basically focused on environment. Now we are also including uh, food. We are also including indoor environment or the thermal. Uh, exposure. We are also working on internal exposure. We are interested on in how absorption, metabolism, distribution, and elimination processes are happening. And of course, we want to apply this uh, kind of approach to the uh, maximum amount of people we can or just reach a population. And 
that would be like to inform and then let the authorities just to yeah, make decisions about it. What I would say like is kind of like newer approach uh, what we are taking is because we are using like high resolution mass spectrometry approaches. So when we go to uh, let's say traditional uh, external exposure assessment, people is usually staying here in the target quantification. That's what people usually do with low risk instruments. In our case, we are having like a, a GC high resolution and also LC mass res uh, high resolution that allow us like covering like a wide uh, number of organic pollutants and we are working in four different like approaches. We, are, we started first in target quantification because we wanted to be sure that our methods were comparable with the low resolution properly established methods. And now we are moving to target screening, suspect screening, and also non-target screening. I would say these two are the main um, areas we are right now focusing in. And the long-term idea is also going to non-target screening, but not trying to find everything on everything, would be just, uh, or trying to find like, uh, or characterize or profile or like uh, defining like if we can find like a uh, go for specific features. So my poster is number 35. I know this would take me forever to explain. So I'm yeah, more than happy answering all of your questions. Thank you, Anna. Um, well done for being the quickest one so far, I think. Um, so that was the human health area. We're now, we're now moving to the environment. Um, our next presenter uh, is Marco Ferranti from Aarhus University in Denmark. And he's going to be talking about bionic caterpillars. Hi, everybody. Uh, the work I'm going to present was done during my PhD and is about monitoring. Ecological monitoring is usually done um, and focus on biodiversity, on structures, rather than on functions. Uh, the reason is that we are better, actually, at monitoring biodiversity measures. We tend to uh, analyze the species richness and relative abundance, rather than ecological processes. The problem is that uh, uh, when we analyze uh, processes indirectly, uh, we may not obtain correct estimates. Take, for example, biological control. Um, biological control is usually quantified by counting the number of predators, even if there is no guarantee that doubling the number of predators will mean doubling predation rates. In this work, we try to measure directly predation using artificial caterpillar made of plasticine. We use these caterpillars at ground level and canopy level in maize fields in several European countries and Argentina. This work was done within the AMIGA project. AMIGA was an international project aimed to develop monitoring tool for gem crops. And we found a daily predation rate of 11.7% after 24 hours. And most predators were chewing insects, very likely ground beetles. Uh, another half of the predators were vertebrates, essentially small mammals and birds. And we also find uh, a much higher predation rate at the ground level than on canopy. Uh, this was true everywhere but in Argentina, where the predation rate at canopy level and at ground level were the same. We found that uh, the predation rates in the two hemispheres were similar, which was surprising. And also that predation rate at the lower latitude, it depends mostly on uh, chewing insects, on invertebrates. In Essentially, in Argentina and Italy, the community, the predator community, were more similar. Uh, we conclude that the method is useful to provide comparable data, which are uh, particularly important in a large-scale study. Uh, it's much more easy to compare predation rate than predator communities, essentially. And essentially, uh, the artificial caterpillar method is suitable as a post-monitoring tool for gem crops. Uh, for any discussion, we can continue at uh, the gala. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marco. If you're in the human health session today, you would have heard some talk on adverse outcome pathways. Now you're going to hear another three minutes of talk on adverse outcome pathways. And the speaker is, I'm proud to welcome Desiree Minio from the European Food Safety Authority. Thank you. I'm going to introduce you the adverse outcome pathway, 
relative to the redox cycling of our chemical initiated by mitochondrial respiratory chains release electrons leading to Parkinsonian motor deficits. The adverse outcome pathway is a toxicological framework that connects a, a molecular initiating event to a, an adverse outcome by a series of biological events defined as key events. By doing this, it explores um, mechanistic evidences at different levels of biological organization from molecular level to organism. Adverse outcome pathways are compound agnostic, meaning that any chemical can activate a molecular initiating event. The purpose of this tool is to investigate the biological plausibility of the epidemiologic association between pesticide exposure and human health outcomes. As you can see from the picture, uh, the molecular initiating event of this AOP is the redox cycling of a chemical initiated by mitochondrial respiratory chains, released electrons, followed by the next step, mitochondrial dysfunction, which in turn is linked to impaired proteostasis, which in turn is linked to degeneration of dopaminergic neurons of the nitrociata pathway, leading to the final adverse outcome, that is Parkinsonian motor deficits. AOPs are not only about key events, but also about key events relationship within each of the key events. Uh, while biological plausibility and empirical support are considered for each of the key events relationship, essentiality is considered for each of the key events. So in conclusion, AOPs are powerful regulatory tools as they integrate mechanistic knowledge on disease pathogenesis. Moreover, also partial AOP, where not all the key events are known, can be useful to identify data gaps. They also provide indication on the biological plausibility of an adverse outcome and species difference, and they help in the revision of regulatory studies. So if you have any other question, you can find me in the poster 34. Thank you. Thank you very much, Desiree. <coughs> very interesting. So um, we've had uh, six presentations all in the natural sciences areas. Um, the final presentation this evening is in the social science area. Um, let's not forget the title of this conference is Science, Food and Society. Um, and it's good that we're finding at EFSA a bit of room for social research uh, also it, in relation to the work that, the, that we do. Um, I'd like to welcome up on the stage Paolo Giardullo from the University of Padua, who's going to talk about newsworthiness of food risk and safety assessments. Hello, does it work? Okay, thanks. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, well, uh, we all know that food risk communication is important, of course, but it's important, moreover, to understand how uh, communication works. I started with, in, my, in this uh, early stage research about uh, food risk and safety newsworthiness uh, exactly from the, um, uh, the newsrooms, how newsrooms works. Basically, newsmakers in newsrooms uh, select events, uh, give priority to them, uh, give uh, room and space to them, and moreover, they frame them. Basically, the, uh, the process of newsmaking is a process of building stories. What about uh, food risk? Food risk stories works in the, in the same way, but there are some specific features. According to uh, previous research on this, newsmakers basically uh, look for uh, some of these features that are the potential victims of a trait, uh, and also someone that has to be blamed for that trait. And normally, this takes the shape of xenophobia. Uh, for and uh, uh, distrust of foreign food. Then they look for something uh, in order to cheer their public and to protect them. For instance, giving them ad some advice what should be done, uh, what uh, should be avoided. Then they try to look for uh, links to other similar cases, uh, normally past events according to uh, this previous research on this, uh, on this topic. And finally, they try to create controversy by giving uh, room to different voices involved in a food risk threat. What I found, well, 
what I've done first. Uh, what I've done is a content analysis of already published food uh, risk news in uh, comparing UK and Italy uh, in daily press. What I found is basically uh, a strong connection between uh, the narration of uh, actual uh, food risk uh, with uh, uh, data uh, about morbidity and uh, uh, mortality, also linked to the um, to the uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, also linked to the uh, uh, official uh, report about uh, um, uh, food risk uh, research, and also this is linked with. Uh, 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 so, uh, the the other feature of uh, try to pro uh, tries to protect the public from uh, food risk and hazard. This anchors uh, with not necessarily with other uh, past stories as it was supposed to be, but uh, it more uh, linked with uh, uh, science communication. What differs uh, among the uh, between the two contexts is. What is foreigner and, uh, and what is not trustworthy as a food? This is very important because it dif uh, the two contexts are different because of also of uh, the ethnicity the, uh, of the two population, the multi, uh, the multi ethnic context of the UK compared uh, much more co uh, multi ethnic compared uh, to the Italian one, and also. Uh, the second element is about the opportunity for uh, controversy that often promote food risk as a source for political debate. While in the UK, uh, what is on top recently is about uh, the use of antibiotics in food chain production. In Italy, it is more on herbicide use, uh, as for instance in glyphosate. If you want to know more about uh, this early stage uh, research, please uh, check the poster at number 126 or contact me. Thanks. Thank you, Paolo. Very interesting. Um, <coughs> so that's the last of the presenters this evening. Just to remind you that you can vote for your favorite poster and please remember that there are 200 posters, not just the ones that we see up here on the stage. Um, you can vote by using your app. Um, for those of you who are here in attendance, um, we'll be um, the voting continues. I think till um, tomorrow afternoon. I think, um, and then the the, the prize the prize will be awarded on Friday at the final session. So um, hope to see you again tomorrow at the last of our three um, poster presentation sessions. Thank you very much. <laughs>